Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to 3 News Now. I'm Stephanie Haney. It's Monday, November 9th. I've got your top stories from WKYC.com and our WKYC app. Thank you very much for choosing to be here to get filled in on the things that are impacting you here in Northeast Ohio. And a very happy Monday it is after what was a very stressful week for a lot of people on all sides of the political spectrum. It is nice to be able to come to you on this Monday and say that we do have an answer as to who will be the next president of the United States, just based on all the uncertainty in the race to 270 Electoral College votes. Both NBC News and the Associated Press, as well as other outlets, but those are the sources of information that we've been tracking here, not sources of information, but reporting of the information that we've been tracking here at 3 News to say that former Vice President Joe Biden is now president-elect of the United States and has been projected to win the necessary 270 electoral college votes. Both the Associated Press and the NBC News came out with that projection on Saturday. So that's when the call was made around the country. Now, the Associated Press has projected that Joe Biden has won Arizona. NBC News still has not. So by NBC News's count, Joe Biden right now is projected to have 279 electoral college votes. Arizona and Georgia are still counting votes. And by NBC News standards, those are still too close to call at this point. And North Carolina and Alaska have also still not been called. Those are expected to go for President Donald Trump. But right now, all eyes are on Georgia for control of the Senate. That's the next political contest that people are looking at because there will be a runoff election in January in Georgia. And both of Georgia's senators are up for re-election. There are two Republican incumbents being David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler. So all eyes on Georgia right now because of that runoff. Neither of them got enough votes to be just outright projected to be the winners of those elections right now. So that'll be coming up in January. So lots of talk to be happening about Georgia in the coming weeks and months. Election talk is not over. President-elect Joe Biden has made good on his promise to get started with a coronavirus advisory board. He named that board today and is now urging everyone to wear masks to combat COVID-19. He did say that Americans are facing a dark winter, is what he called it, and that we need to be aggressive about mask wearing and social distancing in order to fight COVID-19. We're going to get to some record numbers here in just a moment when it comes to COVID-19, but infections are surging around the country also here in Ohio. And Pfizer announced today promising results from a vaccine trial. We'll also get to that in just a moment. But even with that being the case, it would still be months before a vaccine could be widely available if they get to that point where it's even approved for emergency use at this point. Again, more to come on that later. But we do need to touch on something that is a very important topic of conversation around the country right now. President Donald Trump has not yet conceded the presidency to President-elect Joe Biden and has said that he will file lawsuits. So he's been saying that over the past several days and is expected to file a new wave of lawsuits today. He is alleging that there was voter fraud in both Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. President Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, said that there are a group of poll watchers who are willing to testify that there were issues counting the ballots and that they were treated unfairly. However, the president and Rudy Giuliani and people who are continuing to make these claims have not put forth any evidence. They haven't shown any evidence publicly, aside from this statement that people are willing to testify, but no actual evidence of any voter fraud. And experts say that voter fraud is not an issue here in the U.S., with many experts saying that we can absolutely trust the results of these elections. Also, keep in mind, Judges have already thrown out or ruled against President Donald Trump's campaign in lawsuits that have been brought in Pennsylvania, Nevada, Georgia, and Michigan. And the narrative from President Donald Trump has changed as the leads have changed in these states. At one point, late after Election Day, early in the hours of the next day, Wednesday, November 4th, President Donald Trump was saying, stop the vote. And then when we saw that lead switch to now president-elect Joe Biden being projected as the winner. President Donald Trump was saying, keep counting the votes. The point is here, many officials are saying, you know, count every vote. Every vote will be counted. That's what we do here in the U.S. That is a democracy. But President Donald Trump's narrative definitely changing throughout the process. 
A point, though, to make about him alleging voter fraud in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Again, the Associated Press has already called the state of Arizona for Joe Biden. If Joe Biden maintains that lead and does win Arizona, it won't be necessary for him to have won the state of Pennsylvania in order to get the required electoral college votes. Also, the same goes for him leading in Georgia at this point, which has also not been called yet because the vote count is still going on there. Now, bringing things back here to Ohio, Governor Mike DeWine held a press conference this afternoon with several doctors addressing how COVID-19 is impacting Ohio's hospitals. Now, this was after last Thursday, Governor Mike DeWine said that 86% of Ohio's population is living in a red county. That's that level three alert under the Ohio Coronavirus Public Health Advisory System. He said that all 88 counties in the state, every single county is at a high incidence rate of spread of COVID-19. These are obviously not metrics that we want to see going into the colder months when more people are going to be inside. So there's been a press conference today for the hospitals and area medical professionals to talk about how hospitals are being impacted by this. One thing that was mentioned in the in the press conference is that contact tracing is becoming difficult because the number of cases are so high in Ohio at this point that makes it difficult. And all of the medical professionals urging people to wear the masks, keep that physical distance. We have that up on WKYC.com and our WKYC app, as well as our Facebook and YouTube pages. So you can check out that press conference from medical professionals around the state talking about the importance of getting the COVID-19 surge that we've seen here under control. We do have those latest numbers from the Ohio Department of Health, and we continue to see high numbers, not in the 5,000s for new cases today, but still high numbers. There are now 4,706 reported cases of COVID-19 newly reported today on Monday, November 9th. That's up from yesterday when we saw 4,541 new reported cases after a couple days when we were in the 5,000s. We've been in either the 4,000s or the 5,000s of new reported cases since November 3rd, the last day that we were below 4,000 was November 2nd when there were 2,909 new cases reported. So again, these numbers, not the direction we want to be going. And when we look at our positive rate for testing, also not the direction we want to be going. The seven-day average right now for positive tests for COVID-19 is at 8.4%. That is the highest it's been since May, well above that World Health Organization recommended threshold of 5%. The latest known daily figure for positive tests for COVID-19 was 10%. That's the highest that it's been since April. So all of these numbers just to drive the point home that these new cases being so high is not tied to increased testing because of the percentage. When we see the percentage go up, we see that it's not just a simple numbers to numbers comparison because it's the percent of tests that are coming back positive have also gone up. So we see the increase is actually due to the increase in spread. There have been seven new deaths reported related to COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. That brings the total number of people who have died from COVID-19 here in Ohio to now 5,524. And we've seen 154 new people hospitalized in the last 24 hours with COVID. The total number of people hospitalized is now 2,533. That's up quite a bit from Sunday. So today there are 235 more people in the hospital related to COVID than there were on Sunday. And of those 2,533 people who are in the hospital, 628 of them are being treated in the intensive care unit. There have been a total of 34 new ICU admissions in the last 24 hours. Now, statewide, 70% of our hospital beds are being used right now. So 30% of our hospital beds across the state are available for people who need treatment in a medical care facility. It can't be just treated and then set home. Now, let's take a look at the U.S. and the global numbers related to COVID-19, some milestones that we did not want to hit. The U.S. has now passed 10 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, and globally, there have now been over 50 million reported cases of COVID-19, and the deaths are also increasing at a global level. These numbers come from Johns Hopkins University. The latest numbers this afternoon from Johns Hopkins University have the number of reported COVID cases across the U.S. at 10,018,278. 
and the total number of deaths related to COVID-19 here in the U.S. is at 237,742. Now, just over the past several days, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the nation's leading expert on infectious diseases, did say that if we continue at this rate, we will likely see in the coming months days where we have 2,000 deaths per day here in the U.S. related to COVID-19. We've seen many days in a row now where that number has been over a thousand, which again is not a place where we want to be. And if we're taking a look at how the U.S. numbers compare to the global numbers, here in the U.S. we've got about 4% of the global population, but as of right now we've got about 19.8% of the global deaths. And we have, this number has ticked down a little bit, 18.9% of the global deaths. So 19.8% of the global cases, 18.9% of the global deaths here in the U.S. Globally, there have now been 50,715,936 reported COVID-19 cases and 1,259,976 reported deaths related to COVID-19 at the global level. Now, we've been hearing about these vaccine trials that have been underway, and Pfizer is now saying that they've got some good news related to their vaccine trial. Pfizer, Pfizer says early data, now remember, this is early data, shows that its COVID-19 vaccine may be 90% effective at preventing COVID. That's a really high effective rate when you take a look. We don't like to compare COVID-19 to the flu because they are different things, but just in terms of looking at a vaccine, there are certain years when the flu vaccine might be somewhere in the range of the 50 to 60% effective range. So to hear that Pfizer's early results are saying that that might be 90% effective, that's great to hear, even if you're not comparing it to anything else. Now, a monitoring board found 94 infections in Pfizer's study. This was of nearly 44,000 people in the U.S. and five other countries. Now, again, Pfizer did warn that the results can change by the time the study ends, but the company right now is on track to apply later this month for emergency U.S. approval from the FDA. So we'll be obviously monitoring that very closely. Now, with the holidays coming up, the Centers for Disease Control has put out some safety tips for celebrating Thanksgiving in a COVID-19 pandemic. And no surprise to anyone, the CDC is saying we need to take a look at potentially postponing or canceling, if not just limiting the number of people at these holidays events. Now, if you are going to have an in-person holiday event, the CDC is saying host those activities outdoors rather than indoors. Try and limit the guests to people who are just in the local area and really just limit the number of guests as much as possible. Also, encourage people to wear masks while they are visiting and use hand sanitizer. And here's an important thing. If anyone's going to be traveling in from anywhere or really anyone outside of your household, the CDC is saying to ask your guests to strictly avoid contact with people outside of their households for 14 days before the gathering. So what they're saying there is ask the people who you intend to spend that holiday with to quarantine for 14 days before you invite them into a gathered space. Now, when it comes to food and drink safety, the CDC recommends, of course, washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds and not serving things potluck style, but encouraging everyone to have their own drinks and their own food, limiting people around that food preparation area and wearing a mask while preparing food or serving others. Another thing that the CDC recommends using single use options or having one person serve with shareable items. So if you're going to have a big pot of mashed potatoes, for example, have one person be at the mashed potatoes, label out that food to people, and avoid any self-serve food or drink options. The CDC has also recommended some low-risk Thanksgiving activities, or not necessarily recommended, but designated these activities as low-risk when it comes to Thanksgiving. Having a small dinner with only the people who live in your household, preparing traditional recipes for family and neighbors, and then dropping them off in a low-risk way that doesn't allow for a lot of contact, like perhaps dropping it off on the porch or something like that. Having a virtual dinner and sharing recipes with friends and family. Also, something that's highly tied to Thanksgiving here in the U.S., Black Friday shopping. So the CDC is recommending shopping online rather than in person the day after Thanksgiving or through that following Monday. And of course, doing some of those usual activities like watching the sporting events and the parades. The Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade will be happening. You can watch that on three, but doing that from home and 
lots of those things won't even necessarily be open to the public. For example, the Macy's Thanksgiving parade won't be open to the public per se, but watching those things from home with the people in your household. Now, as we've all been talking about COVID-19, and some people are using this as, as an opportunity to sort of revisit things that they might not have had time for, if you're considering going back to school, here's something to know about. Kent State University is waiving application fees in November, so prospective students can apply for free until December 1st. Other things to know about, they've waived their ACT and SAT standardized testing requirements, and they're going to be taking a more holistic approach to determining admissions. And everyone who applies will automatically be considered for a merit-based scholarship. So keep that in mind if you're thinking about going back to school. Kent State University is waiving those application fees and making things just a little bit easier to apply right now. Now, as we look ahead to the weekend, I know it's Monday, but let's look ahead to the weekend just for a moment. Great news out of the Cleveland Browns. Nick Chubb running back is off of the injured reserve. He's been out since week four when the Browns took on the Dallas Cowboys. He suffered an MCL injury during that game, and he's missed the last four games, but he will be back. He's been taken off the injured reserve list, so we'll see him when the Houston Texans come here to Cleveland at First Energy Stadium on Sunday. Now, there are still people out. There are still people who are injured. Wyatt Teller, for example, are waiting to see what haps, happens with him. And also quarterback Baker Mayfield has been placed on the COVID-19 reserve list. He, that happened on Sunday, but he could be eligible to return to practice as soon as Wednesday. So that's something else we'll be watching. But very happy to know that Nick Chubb avoided surgery and he will be back on the field on Sunday against the Houston Texans. One more thing to let you know about before we go. It is Cleveland Pizza Week and Cleveland Restaurant Week to go. So from now through the 15th, you can get $8 pizza pies from dozens of places around Cleveland. Some of them include Citizen Pie, Dante's Inferno, Market Garden Brewery, Salted Dough, just to name a few. We've got the whole breakdown on WKYC.com and our WKYC app. And if you download the Cleveland Pizza Week Passport, if you get four stamps, so if you have four pizzas this week, you can win 250 bucks in gift cards. That wouldn't be a bad bonus in addition to getting to eat pizza four days this week. Also, Cleveland Restaurant Week to Go is now underway. That extends a little bit longer. That's starting today and that goes through November 20th. And lots of great places participating in this. Edwin's, Fahrenheit, Lago East Bank, one of my personal favorites. The lobster gnocchi there is absolutely delicious. Pier W, tons of great restaurants you can get. You can have some of their delicious food for a little bit nicer price for Cleveland Restaurant Week to go. We've also got those details up on WKYC.com and our WKYC app. That's it for your three news now update for Monday, November 9th. I'll see you next up on What's New at 5 p.m. with your trending stories in the Clicking in Cleveland segment, which you can watch for free in the WKYC app. So just open up the WKYC app, tap on the watch feature, and then you'll be able to watch us live during that broadcast and all of our broadcasts, by the way. Everyone, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. I'll see you back here tomorrow with more uh, 3 News Now. Stay safe and be well. I'm Stephanie Haney.